Hello, my name is Julia Brown. I'm the Artistic Programs Manager at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis. Thank you so much for watching this video tutorial about using Zoom for new play development workshops and readings. This video is about the nuts and bolts logistics of using Zoom. We'll be going over the main Zoom settings, meeting mode, and webinar or performance mode. I hope that this is helpful for you, um, but please do reach out to me with any specific questions after you watch. Zoom also has a lot of their own tutorials and help guides as well. If you look in the description below this video, you'll see a table of contents. If you already have some familiarity with Zoom, you may want to skip to a later topic at the timestamps that are listed below. The Zoom settings that I'm going to go over with you are on a professional licensed user Zoom account. We have multiple accounts here at the Playwright Center because that allows us to hold multiple overlapping meetings and events. We also have set up our capability for webinars, which you will need to do uh, in order to run readings as we'll demonstrate later in the tutorial. If you have the Zoom app installed on your computer or device, this little icon here, you may be used to creating meetings through the app itself, which you can do here from the home screen and a schedule. And while that's totally great, uh, if you actually do it at zoom.us, the website, you get a lot more settings and options there. In terms of devices that can use Zoom, you can use a desktop, laptop, tablet, or a smartphone. Pretty much anything that can access the internet can use Zoom. However, on a phone or a smaller tablet, you won't necessarily be able to use all of the features or see the full view that I'll be showing you today. For actors, I recommend that they either use Zoom on a computer of some kind or another, or have Zoom on one device and their script on another if they have to use a smaller device. We've run into some trouble with certain types of iPads, particularly older models, not allowing multiple windows to be open at the same time, which means that an actor can't run Zoom and also have a digital script open on the same device. So you'll want to have your actors experiment with this based on their own personal setup. Some artists are old hat at using a digital script, but here are a few tips if this is new to you. In a normal workshop, of course, we would be making copies of the script for everyone every time there's new pages, and we'd be able to swap out individual scenes or pages for new ones in the room. Uh, that's obviously not very easy to do digitally, so we recommend that the playwright send a full new draft of the script every time there's new pages. We've been working both with PDFs and Word docs. At the moment, and this may change depending on the process for different readings, we're actually finding Word is the easiest to work with. So to save time for our actors, we've been uh, highlighting the script for them ahead of time so they don't have to take that time to figure out how to do that on their devices. It also means that as notes or line changes come up, uh, each actor can make those edits in real time in their Word document. We of course recommend that you do that in a different font, a different color, or a highlight of some kind. PDFs can also be highlighted and marked up either in Adobe Acrobat Reader or in Preview. Um, I find Preview to be a little bit easier to work with in this way. What you'll want to do is click on this icon. Sometimes it looks like a pen tip in a circle, sometimes it's a little toolbox, but that gives you this markup toolbar which lets you draw and it lets you highlight and add text boxes if you want to add notes and move things around. Um, Word is a little bit more intuitive, but again, PDFs can be used as well. Now let's talk about a Zoom meeting versus a Zoom webinar. A meeting is a setup where there is a host or co-hosts and then everyone else on the call is the same type of participant, meaning they can see, hear, and do the same things. This means people can turn on their microphone and their video and they can participate directly in the conversation. We found that this is helpful for discussions, meetings, and classes that include participation and that are a relatively small group. Um, generally, you know, 50 people or less. Uh, webinars look very similar to a meeting, but they allow uh, for two different types of participants, panelists and then attendees. 
Panelists are those that can be seen and heard, while attendees are just observing. They won't have their video capabilities turned on, and they need to be given permission to turn their microphones on. We find that webinars are most helpful for things like readings, panel discussions, performances, etc., where the audience isn't participating at all or isn't participating as much, especially when you have a large group of people to manage. Depending on how you want to run your rehearsal, you may find rehearsing in meeting or webinar mode works best for you. The one thing to keep in mind is that if you are opening your reading to the public, it's a good idea to quote unquote open house for that event at least 15 minutes ahead of time so that you can get your audience settled. So if you're rehearsing right up until your reading, you may want to be on a different call so the audience isn't observing your rehearsal. Then you can have your whole team hop over to the performance link together. So here we go. We will start at zoom.us and sign in. Now we're going to start with uh, general settings. So a lot of this is personal preference, but there are certain settings that can help a reading go more smoothly. The first thing that we'll see is my account, so I can see my own general settings. The settings I'm showing you are for a licensed user, which you can see here. And then you can see our capacity is set at 300 attendees for a meeting, 500 for a webinar. So I'm going to talk about this very briefly. Each of you will have your own agreements with Actors' Equity that may dictate the size of your audience. We decided to upgrade to the 500 attendee webinar level, not because our audience is going to be 500 people. Our audience capacity remains around 100 to 150, depending on the size of the creative team. However, we found that the lower capacity, um, the lower capacity that Zoom offers is 100 for a webinar. And with the lower capacity, we have had some issues with internet um, speed and video lagging. So we were told, think of it like a highway. The 100 attendee level is kind of like a two-lane highway, while a 500 level is like a six-lane highway. So the less congestion on, quote-unquote, the road, the clearer your video feed, you're less likely to have lagging audio, things like that. Whatever level you choose, of course, will be based on your budgets, your audience needs, and all of that. So down here, you can edit your default time zone. Time zones are definitely something to keep in mind when you're doing online workshops. It's a great opportunity to involve artists and audience members from outside your area, but you need to get in the habit of including your time zones in all your communications. Now let's go up to the general settings. I recommend taking some time with all of these when you have a moment, but I'm just going to highlight some specific ones that come in handy for our purposes. Some of these you'll be able to adjust also when you're creating a meeting or a webinar, so it can depend on what exactly you're working on. This is also where you can go to um, recordings if you record one of your events. I find it helpful to have the chat function on, which is right here. We'll talk about this in the meeting itself. Uh, it's also nice to allow private chats, though it's important to note that all chats, whether they are private or not, are visible in the post-meeting chat download if your organization is going to use that function. So people should just know that even if you're chatting privately between one person, the transcript is still going to be available. I have set the availability to file transfer via Zoom. This is something that can be helpful if, for example, during rehearsal, your dramaturg has a packet to share with your cast, or maybe there's a quick replacement page or a scene that you want to send to everybody right in the meeting without having people having to go to their email or things like that. I like to allow a co-host so that the director and the stage manager can have the same sort of capabilities on Zoom. You can also change the host within the meeting itself in real time, which I'll show you in a little bit. Polling is something that I turn on as an option. We'll talk about it later. You don't always have to use it, but it's a nice way to build in some interaction with your audience. Likewise, I have allowed screen share. Um, you'll be able to adjust this in each meeting too. 
Now, you've probably heard about folks having trouble with what's being called Zoom bombing, where online trolls will log on to a meeting or an event and hijack the screen share, putting up disturbing images or things like that. So there are settings that we can talk about later that can help avoid this, and Zoom has built in some security settings to the meetings themselves as well. But if you're super concerned about Zoom bombs or you don't want to set up these extra measures, you can turn off screen share entirely, so that's not even a thing anyone could do. Now if we go down to nonverbal feedback, it's kind of an oddly titled setting. Um, it turns on some functions that I'll show you in the meeting that is kind of a nice option. It's things like letting basically the attendees or the people on your meeting still interact without having to have their mics on. Now this one, allow removed participants to rejoin. I have this set up, but if you are having problems with things like Zoom bombing, this is something that you can turn off so that if you boot someone for a meeting, they can't rejoin. I recommend allowing participants to rename themselves, so we'll talk about this in the meeting as well. Now things like breakout rooms are things that can be helpful for rehearsals or for classes. If you want folks to work in small groups or maybe you work on this scene, you work on that scene. I'm not going to go into how to use this right now, but I recommend looking into it if you have a program that would benefit from small group work. Closed captioning is also a possibility that I'm not going to be talking about today, but if you have the capability to either live type captions or you have access to a third party captioning program, this is where you would set that up. So talking really quickly about accessibility for online readings, especially for deaf or hard of hearing audiences, we found that live captioning a play or a class isn't something that we can accomplish effectively um, at the moment. So what I've done instead is that I've added some language to our event reminders to say that if you have any access needs related to hearing the reading, to let us know. And then in that case, I would send the most updated draft of the script to that individual audience member right before the reading so that they can see the text um, as well as the reading. Now, virtual backgrounds, I'm sure most of you have seen this, had some fun with these, but they actually can be useful for a reading. We have turned it on as an option in the, in the case that an actor may have a privacy concern about showing parts of their home or wherever it is that they're working, or people who don't have the option of a neutral background, like maybe there's nowhere that they have internet access, where they don't have pets or kids running around in the background, or things like that. We haven't used it a lot, but it's a nice option to have if you have an artist who's in that situation. Now if we go down to waiting rooms, waiting rooms can be helpful in setting up your meeting as well. This basically means that the host needs to admit each person individually into the meeting. So we've been using that for our classes and seminars. You can see I don't have it turned on as my default, but it's something that you can turn on when you create each meeting. Okay, let's look into setting up a meeting. As I said before, you can do this in two ways. You can do it here in the app by going to your home screen and hitting schedule, or you can do it on the Zoom site. So we go to meetings here, and like I said before, I recommend using the site because you just have some more options. You can see here all of the meetings that I currently have scheduled on my account. So let's click schedule a new meeting. Here's where we give it a title. We'll say we're going to rehearse a play of mine. You can also add a description with more details if you'd like. If this is something that's like a one-off meeting or a one-time rehearsal um, or something that happens at the same time each week, like maybe a staff meeting or a production meeting that happens every Monday at 2, then you can add the date, the time, and the duration here and set a recurring meeting for a particular daily, weekly, etc. For things like a rehearsal where maybe it's at a different time each day but you want to keep using the same link, I would say recurring and no fixed time. So this means any time we start the meeting is good to go. Now I don't generally require a password as I'm only going to be sending the link to this meeting to the people who are in that rehearsal. 
If you are in a situation where you're sharing links publicly, like on your Twitter or your website, you might want to add a password. Um, I've also decided that everybody in this rehearsal is going to start with their video on. Uh, I think it saves some time for people to scramble and figure out how to do that. But again, that's totally going to be up to you. If you're doing something like a class where you have one teacher, you'll probably want to have the host on, participants off. I've also decided to allow both telephone and computer audio. When I cast the readings, when I first reach out to the actors, I make sure that they know that they need the capability to use Zoom on their computers and to have a webcam and computer audio because that's the most ideal way to do it. Um, I do allow telephone as an emergency backup though, just in case like an actor's internet goes out or something happens so we can have a backup. So it's important to let your actors know at the very front end before you dive into rehearsal, what's the technology they need, um, how it's gonna be set up. I also like to ask and make sure they're comfortable working with a digital script so that we don't run into trouble down the road. For rehearsals, I have enabled join before host so that if actors show up early before our stage manager or director are there, they can hang out, they can chat like you would do before you know any rehearsal in person. That's gonna to be totally up to your preference. For something like a class, you'll probably want to mute participants on entry so that they're just seeing or hearing the teacher or the host at the beginning. And you may wanna, as I said before, enable the waiting room there. If you have the waiting room on, basically when people join your meeting, they'll see a screen that says you're in the right place, the host will admit you when they're ready. And then as the host, you'll see their names pop up as people sign in and you can admit them one by one. Sometimes you may want to record your meetings, probably not for rehearsals or readings unless you have an agreement with equity that allows that. It's very important to let everyone on the call know if you are recording. You can either record to the cloud or record to your device. So you can access your cloud recordings here on the side if you choose to do that. Now alternative hosts are super helpful. I like to make the stage manager, so in this case that's our apprentice, or maybe the director both to be hosts so that they have the same powers and functions within the meeting. It also means that um, if somebody needs to leave, there's someone else who can keep the meeting going. You'll also be able to trade around host duties in the meeting itself. Now, one thing to note is that if someone is assigned a host while creating the meeting here, you won't be able to completely take hosting privileges away from that person. So I wouldn't list you know, everybody who's gonna be in your meeting, um, just whoever you think needs the most controls. And then we save. So now to share the information with our group, we can either just you know, send this link or click copy the invitation where we have the link and the phone numbers as well. If you need to make any changes, you click this white edit the meeting button here. Okay, let's run our meeting. I can click join now. It'll say either start meeting or join now. This means that someone else on my team has already joined. I can click on this or any of the links in the invitation. I usually let it run from the app. That tends to work most smoothly. Yeah. And we can see yeah. that some of our team is here already. If I didn't have it enabled to say join before host, then these folks would have seen a screen that says waiting for host to join call until I came on. So here are some of the features of a Zoom meeting. Most everything that you see here is also what your team is going to see on their screens. There are a couple special features that are only available to the host, the main one being this bottom right end meeting. Everyone else sees one that says leave meeting. So if, for example, Hannah goes off the call, the meeting would continue. But if I end the meeting, it ends it for everybody. If you started as the host of a meeting and then you need to leave, you can actually turn someone else into the host. And I'll do that by clicking gallery view 
and I'll click the blue dot 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 that's in the corner of everybody's video box. I'll tell you more about these features in just a little bit, but on this uh, drop down you can see make host. So I can click on that, which means that Hannah is now the host of the meeting. All right. And then Hannah, if you can make me the host again, that would be great. So let's start at the bottom left here. This is where you will mute and unmute yourself and where you will start and stop your video. There are also, if you're using a Mac, there are shortcuts that you can use. Shift Command V will turn the video on and off and Shift Command A will unmute and mute yourself. These up arrows will allow you to adjust your audio and your video settings if you need to. If you have somebody who's working with an external microphone or a plug-in mic uh, or maybe an external webcam, they may need to select those devices, which should pop up on this list here. This up arrow by the video also is where you can choose your virtual background, which we talked about a little bit earlier. If you have an actor who's concerned about having their home or wherever they are being seen by an audience. Some operating systems don't support them very well, so you'll need to play around with it. But here you can see there are some default backgrounds. I might pick something like a blank white page like this. As you can see, as I move around, it's not the most ideal, but if uh, that's the best option for one of your actors, it's an option. If you need to add a new image, you can do that by clicking this plus sign here. But I'll turn it off and be in my home. Now let's look up here where the views are. Where we are right now is called gallery view. That's the Brady Bunch mode, but you can also click speaker view. This basically means what whoever has last spoken or is currently making noise is going to pop up in the main screen and you'll see everybody else on a bar along the top or along the side. We tend to prefer gallery view because it means you can see everyone at once and sometimes if someone's has background noise, they might pop in as, as the speaker view in times when you're not wanting to look at that person. You can also, as the host in gallery view, mute people specifically or unmute them. So if I'm unmuting Hannah, that is going to send, hello, more of our team are here. Um, that's going to send a message asking to unmute. Now let's click on the participants tab at the bottom. This is an important one for being the host of a meeting. From here, you can mute everyone or unmute everyone. You can also remove people from the call if you need to. For example, by clicking this more button, I can stop someone's video, I can make them the host, I can also rename them and remove them from the call if you need to. In terms of renaming, we found that that's a good thing for people to be able to do. Either the host can do it for everyone or people can do that for themselves individually. Sometimes you might want to use people's real names, but sometimes you may want to set it to a character name or for things like a discussion or a class, it's nice to have your name and your pronouns to make conversation flow a little easier. You can also click on more down here for some extra settings. Some that you may want to use would be if, for example, this were a class, I might want to mute participants on entry so that just the teacher would be speaking. And you can also, as you heard, when Emily and Sunny joined, there was that chime sound. You can turn that on and off. Sometimes if you're in the middle of a run through and someone's maybe leaving and coming back or someone has connection issues that they keep coming in and out, it's nice to turn that chime off so you're not interrupted every time that happens. Now I like to keep my chat window open. So the chat function is right down here. If I don't have it open and for example, Emily sends me a chat, if you could send me one right now, just as an example, then you'll see it's going to pop up in the bottom of my screen like this, which can be a little distracting, especially if you're in the middle of a scene. So I like to keep the window open. It's a little easier to ignore over here. And if you're in the middle of acting and you don't want to deal with that at all, you can always take your screen like this and just scoot it right off the edge, just so that everyone in the rehearsal knows, are we using the chat function, are we not, who are we able to communicate with. As the host, you can control who and how people chat. So as you can see, I have a chat from Emily, and so it says this is who I'm chatting with. I can also set that to everyone. Ooh, I'll move this back on. And with this 
ellipses button, I can decide, can the participants chat with each other? Can they chat with just me? Or can they chat publicly? So that's a setting that you may want to do if, you're, if you want to control kind of who's using the chat. As you can see, when Emily chatted it to me, it was private, so it's showing up in red. But as a reminder, even private chats will show up in the chat download if you have that set up um, at the end of your meeting. So it's a good thing for people to know. Now let's talk really quickly about acting on Zoom. So you wanna be sure that your actors are lit from the front um, and that everyone is as centered in the window as they can be. Um, as you can see, a lot of our lovely team here is well lit. You can see maybe we're missing some of Elena's face, so we would ask that she maybe bring in a lamp or find a different way to, to set herself up. It's also helpful to have as neutral a background as possible. So as you can see, Sunny here has a great neutral background, um, and maybe we would ask that Snem find a wall or a curtain, or um, some people have put up a sheet. It just kind of helps feel like everyone's in the same space. I would maybe in my house take down this painting so that my wall is a little more blank. So the other thing is the camera. Um, actors need to know where their camera is. And so that's an, a, an odd thing to get used to with acting. Obviously, you wouldn't be directing your gaze at the image of the person you're talking to. You would be talking right into the camera. It's also important to uh, arrange your script in a way that you can see your camera. So for example, if you're working with a digital script, let's say my Word document here is my script. If I have my script down here, you're gonna see a lot of up and down like this as I go back and forth between the script and the camera. So we found it helpful to move your script to the top of the screen as much as possible, and then to kind of squish down your zoom. And sometimes that means going into speaker mode so you can squish it down lower. So I can see my fellow actors down at the bottom here, but I can also be reading right by where my camera is. So it's something to have actors play around with. Obviously everyone's device is gonna be different. Um, so we, we definitely uh, advise doing some test calls beforehand so people can learn how to get their setup. We also recommend doing a sound test with everybody on the call. Some people, just based on their device and where they are, are going to sound clearer through when they have headphones on, and some people will sound clearer without. So it's nice to test it by maybe having a couple of people speak. So if we say, Katie and Erica, can you just say a couple words to each other, and then we can see what your sound quality is like. Yeah. How are you doing, Katie? I'm good, Erica. How are you doing today? I'm great. We were just talking about haircuts. Now we all need one. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> So you can see that they, they do sound kind of in the same place. Their sound quality is similar. Um, so that's just a thing to, to try out, especially between actors who have a lot of scenes together. You can also tell that I don't have my script up by my camera. I'm looking at a different device. So you want to try and avoid that with an actor. If you have a script that's printed out or that you need to have on a different device, try and set up some kind of way that you can still be addressing your camera as much as possible. Now in terms of headphones, we actually have found that wired headphones tend to be clearer than wireless. So if you have the option between one or the other, we've found wired to work a little bit better. Also, if you're wearing a headset or one of those earbuds that has a mic on it and you have long hair, you may want to pull your hair back because that can be a really loud sound when hair starts brushing against your microphones. Now Zoom, the, the thing about audio on Zoom is it will not allow multiple people to talk at the same time. It's sort of the setting so that you can hear people clearly. Um, so it's, it kind of mutes certain people when others are speaking. So that means unfortunately that things like music or unison speech or lots of interruption can sometimes be a little difficult to do on Zoom. So like for example, if everybody unmute yourself and then Let's just sing the first line of happy birthday, just to hear what that sounds like. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. So it's terrible. So, so just so you know, that's what it's going to sound like. So unfortunately, that means some adjusting of, of how you want to present the script at times. Now, sometimes you're going to want people to exit the scene. 
you may decide you want to keep people on on stage the whole time and just be silent, but it can be really effective to have people turn off their video and turn off their audio. So let's have um, Jasmine and Sunny. Can you exit stage left, please, by turning off your video and audio? Awesome. So what I will do, so this is how the standard of how you're going to see it. So as you can see, we can see all of our faces and then we see Jasmine's name and Sunny's name on a black box. So you may want to leave it like that so you can remember who's on the call, but if you just want to see the people who are currently on stage, then what you can do is go to that blue ellipses button on any of the blacked out screens and then in that drop down, you'll see hide non-video participants. So if I click that, Jasmine and Sunny are still on the call, but I'm not going to see them until they turn their cameras back on. So if Jasmine, if you come back into the scene now, she will just magically appear. There we go, and Sunny is still off stage. If you wanna turn this off, it's up here, this drop down. It'll tell you how many people are currently not being seen but are still on the call. And then you click the drop down and you can show them again. Lovely. Sunny, you can come back on stage. Thank you so much. Now, if you don't wanna see yourself, because sometimes acting to yourself feels very strange, you can go to your own blue ellipses button and click hide self view. So in this case, everyone else can see me. I just can't see me. So the one thing to remember is that people can still see you even if your face isn't on the screen. So don't forget and pick your nose or things like that. If you're ever concerned about, oh my gosh, is my sound on? Is my video on? Down here, if this, the mute button and the stop video button, if they don't have a red slash across them, then you're on. So that is video. And finally, what you can do is screen share. We've found screen shares to be useful for things like pointing out a specific part of the script or maybe sharing a video or during a class to share a packet of information. So we'll click on share screen. If you're sharing something that has like a video or audio associated, you'll want to click share computer sound before you do that so everyone can hear it at the same time. And from here you can see you can choose the individual screen. I can show my whole desktop, but it tends to be more effective to pick the exact page or document that you want to be showing so that you don't have to worry about what emails you have open or what Google search you did last or anything like that. So I'll click on this slide and share it with the team. So everything that is surrounded in green is what the team can see. And as you can see, their videos ended up over on the side of the screen. And we can move this around if, if we need to. Now, if you need to get back to your toolbar but you don't wanna stop screen sharing, that's perfectly easy. Just mouse over this green bar and your toolbar will pop up again. As you can see, we use this slide at the end of our readings, which we'll talk about later in the webinar section. And now I just click stop share and it'll go back to normal. There are plenty of other settings in the meeting that I definitely recommend playing around with, but those are the main ones that we use for workshop rehearsal and reading purposes. So I'm gonna end the meeting now. Thank you so much to my wonderful team, and we'll move on to the webinars. Okay, let's talk about setting up a webinar. You'll find this very similar to setting up a meeting. So we'll go to webinars here on the side and then schedule a webinar. As before, we can put in our information. So let's say this is gonna be a reading of my play that we just rehearsed. You can set a time. So in my case, I'm gonna say this is a one-time reading. I'll give myself three hours, though you don't have to worry too much about the duration. It's not gonna like turn off at the three hour mark. Um, it's just kind of to estimate so that your attendees know about how long you expect it to be. Again, you can make this recurring. Now this registration button is referring to actually actually Zoom's own registration function, which is something you can set up if it, if it works for you. We have looked into it and for us, uh, we find that Zoom actually isn't able to make a wait list. And so that's a feature that we need 
uh, for our box office. So we actually use an external booking site for our registrations. Uh, in our case, we use Eventbrite. Of course, there are dozens to choose from, but this registration required ju just refers to Zoom's own registration function. Now you'll see your video options here list host and panelists. Again, panelists and attendees are the two types of participants on a webinar. And panelists are the only ones who are able to turn on their video. Attendees won't even have the video option. So I'm gonna turn this on because it'll be me and the actors um, and I'll want all that video on. Now I am going to turn the Q&A function on here so I can show you how that works. This is great for things like a panel discussion that has a Q&A or a reading that has a talk back. You'll also be able to enable a practice session, which means you can start this webinar without anyone else being able to join unless you directly invite them. So I'll turn that on as well to show you how it works. You've got the same recording option and the same alternative host option. And we'll schedule. As before, if you want to edit, it's this white button. And for webinars, the invitation is down here at the bottom of the screen. Again, you can copy and just send the link, but if you want everything with the phone numbers, click copy the invitation and you'll see everything here. The way that we run webinars is we have folks sign up on our website. Again, like I said, via Eventbrite, but anything will work. Um, this allows us to have the waitlist if we need to. So the day before the event, we will send a reminder to everybody who's registered with some notes about how to use Zoom, what it's they're going to need, and a reminder to let us know if they are no longer able to attend so then we can move people off the waitlist. 30 minutes before the start of the event, everyone who is registered gets an email with this link and the invitation inf information. This is our way to try and avoid people posting the link on social media or sharing it out with people via email to a bunch of people who aren't registered. This may not be an issue for all of you, but for the Playwright Center, it's important for people to register in order to attend events. Of course, like every organization, we wanna know who's attending and capture information for communication purposes, but also because we have a certain capacity that's allowed by our equity agreement, Registering makes sure that we're staying around the number that we've agreed to. I know that some folks uh, present master classes or panel discussions that are going to be open to anybody. In that case, you can post this link wherever you want and anybody who clicks on it can access your webinar. I'm going to quickly show you polling. You can add this during your webinar, but you can also add poll questions ahead of time. So as I mentioned before, polling is kind of a nice way to build interaction into a webinar, which is has kind of a minimal amount of interaction. So this is what we've been using it for. We've been using a poll to set up a question, which I can do by clicking add for, is this your first time at a Playwright Center event? And I'll click multiple choice because I want people to say yes or no. If it will type for me. There we go. Oh no. There we go. And same. I'm gonna build in questions like that. It just kind of gives a nice level of interaction that wouldn't exist otherwise. Now we can go to Q&A here. And this is where you can control things like who can see questions before and after they're answered, how much interaction you want to have with your audience. I'll show you how Q&A works, and based on that, you'll be able to decide what settings work best for you. A lot about the webinar is going to look very similar to a meeting, so I'm mostly going to focus on things that are different between meetings and webinars. If you're not familiar with the basic functions of a meeting and skipped that last part, you may want to go back. Now, as you can see, we are currently in practice mode. You can see by this orange bar at the top. If you have given your link out widely, like posted it on Twitter or on your website, um, this is a good place to practice the webinar mode without worrying about people popping in. Uh, in our case, we only send the link out right before the reading. So what I do is I'm going to go ahead and broadcast, which means that my team who has the link can now join. 
Now I have my video on right now. If there's ever a point, if I turn off my video, I'm seeing a blank screen, but my audience is seeing basically a general webinar screen that says the name of the meeting and it says the name of the meeting, it says no one's on video. So they're actually not going to see a plain blank screen. So that's a good thing to keep in mind. We like to try and avoid having times when absolutely no one is on screen just to avoid that kind of weird blank slide. Now when I'm running a webinar, I like to keep my participants tab open. And this is where you'll see the big difference between meetings and webinars. As you saw in the meeting, you just saw one list of participants, but here we see two. So we've got panelists and then we've got attendees. Panelists, as we've said before, is everybody who the audience can see and hear. The attendees, you're not going to see and you're not going to hear unless you give them permissions. So the first time everybody joins a meeting, they're going to appear as an attendee by default. To turn them into a panelist, for example, if I'm adding Elena and Elena is going to be an actor in my reading, I'll click on this more button and then click promote to panelist. So she'll disappear from this list and then she'll pop back on here as a panelist. Now, panelists do still need to turn their video on and unmute themselves. I'm going to go to gallery view because that kind of is the easier way to see each other. Now you can also allow attendees to talk without promoting them to a panelist by clicking on this blue allow to talk button. So for example, Katie, I'm going to allow you to talk. Now Katie still needs to be unmuted and unmute herself, but now that she has, say some words, Katie. Thanks, Julia. Awesome. And then when maybe Katie's done asking her question, I can click on more and disable talking, which will then mute her again. Now when you make somebody into a panelist, like when I promoted Elena, she kind of disappeared for a second and came back. So it, it will, it may look to Elena like she was kicked off the meeting and joined back in. So it's a good thing to let your actors know that that might happen just for a hot second so that they don't get nervous about that. We also like to um, sometimes turn a panelist back into an attendee. For example, for a playwright, it's nice for them to maybe, maybe I'm introducing Elena as the playwright, and then I want her to just be able to watch as an audience member. So I'll go to her name here again, click more, and change role to attendee. As you can see, you also have the same drop-down options that you had for the meeting. So I could stop her video, I could make her into a host, and things like that. Rename her if maybe I wanted to put a character name, things like that. So I'm going to send her back to be an attendee just for, for a minute. Now there are a couple of other settings on this panelist tab in webinar mode. I would recommend, if we click this more button, I would recommend turning this enter exit chime off as we talked about in the meeting, um, just so that when actors are promoted to panelists and people join the call, you're not hearing something every time. Now you can also choose what your attendees can see. So as you can see, we can allow the attendees to raise their hand. We can see, do we want them to see how many people are on the call or not? That's up to you. And then the video layout is important. Follow host view would mean that the attendees can see exactly what I see on my screen. We can also put them in speaker view or gallery view. As I said, we like to do gallery view because it, it just tends to work more smoothly. So I have that set as my default. So for example, if I'm gonna turn Erica into a panelist and Snem into a panelist and Hannah, let's say, these are our actors. So you'll see, I see them in gallery mode and that's exactly what the attendees are going to see because that's the setting that I put. Now, if you have an opinion on the order of the boxes that you want to appear, you can kind of control that. It's not 100% on everyone's device, um, you know, in a particular spot, usually in an upper corner, um, but then depending on when people call in, it'll kind of go left to right down the screen like you're reading a book. 
So for example, if I wanted to get this order, I would have Hannah join the call, then Erica, then Snem. So we've done that by staggering call times. So saying, Hannah, can you please join the call at 145 and Erica at 146, things like that. Like I said, it's not 100% that the whole audience will see it in this order. It's a good thing to, when you're doing the test in rehearsal, have your playwright or your stage manager be an attendee and then ask what they see. But that's the closest that we've come to being able to completely control. Unfortunately, you can't click and drag people around the screen. Now let's take a look at chatting. So chatting is very similar to what would be in the meeting, but in a webinar, you've basically got three options for how the participants and the attendees can chat to you. Unfortunately, there isn't a setting that allows the attendee to only chat to a specific person. So if you click this ellipses button, you'll see, if I make the screen a little smaller, you'll see that attendees can chat with no one. They can chat with all of the panelists, meaning myself and my three actors here, or all panelists and attendees, meaning everybody on the call. So I like to have it set that attendees can chat with all panelists because as the house manager of our readings, I want to make sure that an audience member who has a problem can chat to me. So basically what I have done is I've let the actors know that they will be able to see the chat, but like we talked about in the meeting, like we did before, then they can ignore the chats. I just let them know the chats are my problem, but you know, if you have concerns about people going rogue in your chat or things really being distracting, you can turn that off and say that attendees can chat with nobody. Panelists will always be able to chat with one another and we can chat privately amongst each other. So you can see I can pick one of my three actors here and talk to them directly. If I wanna to talk to a specific attendee, I can do that by going to the list and going to their name and in their more dropdown, chat is one of the options. So if I click this, then I'll be chatting directly to Elena, but also the rest of the panelists will see that as well. So no other attendees besides Elena will see it, but my three actors here, if they have the chat open and are looking at it, will be able to see that. So just something to play around with, how you're gonna use it, how you're gonna instruct your audience to use it, and that'll kind of make a difference. We have found it as a useful way just to give people a chance to ask questions like, what's the runtime? Why can't I see everybody? Things like that. We can do our best to talk them through it as well. I like to open the house for our readings about 20 to 30 minutes before the event. And I keep my video on so that I can greet people. As you'll see, you can see their names as they're joining as attendees. So I can say, oh, hi, Elena's here. Or Jasmine, nice to see you. Things like that. Um, I also have my personal attendee list that we got from our uh, registration platform, which we talked about earlier. So I have that open in another window like this. And then I can look and say, oh, Elena's here, check her off. Jasmine's here, check her off. Sometimes people will have maybe a confusing name. They'll put like Cat Lover 37 or something, in which case I would chat to that person and say like, hey, Cat Lover 37, what's your name? So I can check you in. You can also see if you hover over a name, you can see their email address. So that can be helpful too by trying to try to determine who someone is on your list. Now I like to um, greet people just because it's friendly, but also to do my spiel about, hey, as an audience member, you're not going to be seen or heard. Don't worry about your video. Don't worry about your microphone. But if you need me chat, it's in the bottom of your screen. I tend to do that spiel about every like five to 10 people who join, just so that when new waves of people are coming and I see this number go up, then I can kind of make sure everyone's on the same page. The people who sign on 30 minutes in advance are going to hear it a lot, but I figure it's better to over-inform than under-inform. We also use screen share in webinar mode the same way for a meeting, and we like to do that to throw up this slide at the end. We also have an intermission slide. We can also, if I wanted to, start the call like this, if I had one that says, welcome to this reading, They'd still see our little faces on the side like we're seeing now, but then you've got a, a, a main screen for your audience to see. 
So that's totally up to you. We found it to be a useful tool. Now, if we click on polling here at the bottom, this is where we'll see that test that I put together when we set up um, this meeting. So when you're ready for it, which in our case is during the curtain speech, our producing artistic director says, oh, hey, welcome, information, information. We want to know how many of you it's your first time here. So I will click on this poll. You'll see I created, is this your first time at the Playwright Center? Yes and no. I would just put no once. That was a typo. I can also decide if I want my panelists to vote, if I'm asking if it's our actor's first time working on a Playwright Center thing. And then I click launch poll. So this means it's suddenly become visible to all of my attendees, of which there are four. And so as they start voting, you see how many people have voted and you see what their answers are. So this is a chance to say, I usually leave it up for maybe a minute, you know, see if the highest number I can get responding. And so then I can tell Jeremy, hey, 75% of the people have been here before, 25% have not. It's totally up to me when I want to end it, and I can share out the results and show it to the audience, or I can just chat and say, hey, 25% are new, and send that to somebody specifically. And then I just X out. If I wanted to do a, a new poll, I can also edit or add a new question whenever I wanted to. So the next thing to talk about is the Q&A feature, which you'll see here um, at the bottom next to polling. The Q&A feature is great for things like panel discussions or if you're doing a reading and then a talk back. So Hannah, could you type a question in the Q&A for us, please? And then Emily and I, as the panelists, will be able to see it and answer. Usually I recommend um, being very direct with how you want people to ask questions. If you want them to raise hands and ask questions verbally, if you want them to use the chat, or if you want them to use the Q&A. So it's important to be specific because people have permissions to do all three. So here we can see if we click here that Hannah has asked a great question. So we've got a couple of options on how to answer that. If, for example, let's say Emily is my wonderful esteemed panelist, and this is a question that's going to Emily, I might say, hey, Emily, we have a question from Hannah. She wants to know blah, blah, blah. And then I could click this answer live button, which means that Emily is now going to expound upon the answer to that question. And then when Emily's done, I click done here, and it shows up on the answered column. Once a question is answered and goes into that uh, column, then our audience members can see it. So then um, our other friend in the audience, can you type another question into the Q&A? So if we go back to open, we'll see we don't have any open questions right now because that is in process. Uh, your audience will only see the answer column. They're not going to see open questions, and they're not going to see dismissed questions. A uh, great question. So a great question from our audience member. As I said, we could answer live, or if it's something that has a specific answer that maybe, um, maybe I know the answer to this age-old question, um, I would click type answer, and I can either send it directly privately to that person. So if perhaps they were asking, like, what time does this wrap up? Or can you repeat the name of that play or something? I could do that. Or I can type the answer and send it to be seen by everybody where it would pop up in this answer column. Now, if it's a question that we're not going to have time for, it's off topic for whatever reason, we're, we don't want to have that be shared with the rest of the audience, I can also click dismiss. And you'll see it pops up here on the dismissed column as well. So last notes on webinars, if you are noticing that an actor's video or audio is starting to lag a little bit, the problem, if it's just one person, then the problem is likely that individual person's uh, internet connection or their speed. So sometimes I like to recommend for our casts that if they have control over this, they, recommend, they ask others in their household to maybe not stream during the time of the reading, to avoid doing things like online video games, things like that that take up a lot of bandwidth. 
Um, and also, if they're really having a problem and you're trying to, to find something to, to help in the moment, turning off Wi-Fi on a phone or another device, or if they have like one of those Google Home or Alexas that are constant, have the, the Wi-Fi on all the time, turning that off can sometimes help with things like video lag. And those are the main points of using webinars versus meetings. There are plenty of other settings, uh, as with meetings, that I recommend playing around with, including things like captioning. There are ways to connect to Facebook Live and YouTube and that sort of thing. Um, but I'll leave you to do that uh, for your own organization. Thank you so much for, to my wonderful team uh, for helping out with this demonstration. Thank you for watching. We really hope that you can join us for the rest of our special spring programming, which you can find all of at pwcenter.org. We can't wait to see what you do online. Um, so please do uh, keep in touch and, and let us know it's new. Thank you so much. Bye.